Hey, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Let's go check out our next story. Hi, I'm Hannah Hart and you're watching Behind the Brand. Today I'm here with digital influencer, author, and entrepreneur Hannah Hart. Hannah, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I love your curtains. Thank you. Uh, I usually ask my guests, how'd you get this job? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I guess it's more like, how'd you make this job? You know, because we were in the, I started in March of 2011 and it was actually quite accidental. Um, I went to school and studied literature and Japanese language and was pursuing a career in translation. So I moved from San Francisco, where I'm from, to New York to be a proofreader at a translation firm. And what that's really like is something I like to describe as white collar mining, because you're just looking through stacks and stacks of papers for errors. And so one day I was, um, one day I was talking to a friend uh, on Gchat, you know, because I had just gotten this laptop with a little webcam, and I, she was saying, I miss you, dude, you know, I miss when you would, like, get drunk and cook, man. And I was like, dude, because that's how we talk, dude, I'll make you a video right now. So I opened up Photo Booth and recorded My Drunk Kitchen episode one, even though it was just called My Drunk Kitchen, and just sent it to her via YouTube. Because at the time, YouTube was just a way to send someone a video. Um, and then from there, in the comment section, I saw, well, so then from there, all these strangers started watching it. And in the comment section, people were saying things like, this is my new favorite show on YouTube. And I was like, show on YouTube? What are they talking about? And then I did a little digging and found out that people had an entire subculture of entertainment online. A lot of people watch this show. You know, they're YouTubers, they're entrepreneurs, um, and they're trying to do their own thing. Let's break it down a little bit. You've, you've... You've done a lot in a short amount of time. Um, give us some words of advice, words of wisdom, maybe to like 18, 19 year old Hannah Hart if she was starting today in 2016, 2017. Wow. Well, if I was 18 or 19, I'd say stay in school and finish college, Hannah. <laughs> you know, I was, I think what um, I'm really grateful for is that, you know, March 2011, I was about to turn, I was turning 25. And so I had worked, um, I had finished school, I had already gone out there and started living my life. Um, so it gave me the ability to be really grateful for this very exciting and entertaining possibility. Um, I guess I would say you have to work really hard and it's not about money because you won't make money for a long, long time, you know? Yeah, what is it about then? What is it about money that people love? No, uh, if it's not about money, what is it about? What, what should we be measuring? Like a lot of people see, this is what gets me hung up to. I've talked to a lot of people that have an opinion about this. Like, you know, what is the definition of success or what should we be measuring? Because most of us are just looking at how many likes we're getting. It's the vanity metrics, but right. what do you say? I guess that it is different for every person. For me, I measure my success by feeling joyful and purposeful. Like I really, feeling like I have a purpose brings me joy and bringing people joy gives me a sense of purpose. Yeah, and how do you get there? How do I get there? Yeah, how do you get that happiness? You make, I guess for me, I make things that I'm proud of and I think people will enjoy or get something out of, or I express something that I need to express. You know, one time I did a video that just says, I am insecure, just because I was feeling so insecure and I couldn't get out of my head. And I wanted to film a video and I had this entire other like, you know, um, this other vlog or this other like jokey list that I had that I was gonna do. I was like, I actually just need to talk this through. So it's really kind of just like my own form of personal therapy too. But it was wonderful because the feedback and the response from it was from all these different groups of people that were like, hey, thanks so much for posting that. You have this impression that somebody who seems so confident and so put together doesn't feel this way inside. But it's true. Confidence is a lie. Like, we're all really insecure. <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, I, can, I can second that. Um, walk us through that process of, you know, you're famous now. Um, you've, done a lot of, you've done a lot of cool things. Um, you have an audience, but like walk us through how you dealt with that. Maybe at the same time thinking about, you know, these words of advice to young people who are just getting started or even people who are more experienced that are chasing the fame. Walk us through the pitfalls of that. Well, you know, I talk about this a lot in my new book, Buffering, Unshared Tales of a Life Fully Loaded. Um, I never wanted to be famous. And I think that being recognized is a consequence of the type of content I create. Like I am my best tool. You know, if, if it was possible to publish Buffering without my face on the cover, I would have, you know. Um, but I got the opportunity to do Buffering because of the support of people who follow my career and people that like the content that I create. Um, I really 
personally don't think chasing fame is ever gonna feel attainable or attained. So I really hesitate every time people are like, I wanna make it big on YouTube. And I'm like, wait, 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 back up. It's not about the big, it's about the it. Make what big on YouTube? What are you making? And try and stay there for as long as you can. Yeah, it seems like if you're chasing the fame, you're already doing it wrong. Yeah, you are. Well, because you're never gonna get satisfied. That's a vacuum. Um, talk about some of your more fun or funner, what's the right word, funner, collaborations. Um, you have a, a lot of good friends on YouTube and outside of YouTube, I would assume. Um, you hang out with Grace and people like that. Talk about some of these collabs. Well, one of the blessings of being um, a YouTuber is that you get to work with your friends a lot. Um, you know, in the generation of YouTubers that I came up with, we weren't all sure of what was coming or what was happening. And we certainly weren't really big and famous on YouTube. It's so funny because I've had people you know, with bitterness, be like, well, you get to do collaborations with other people with millions and millions of subscribers, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, I'm sorry, but let me stop you there. When I met Tyler Oakley, one of the most prolific online personalities, he had 18,000 followers on Twitter. Like, when we all met, we weren't looking at each other's numbers. We were just creating content together because that's how you built the space. And now I think people, in that same way they're chasing the fame, are trying to chase views through all collaborations. I really love collaborating because it gives you opportunities to not only work with like-minded people, but work with people that you would never otherwise work with. Like um, Candy Johnson's really like really, really great makeup artist and really great at like becoming characters. And we're gonna do a collab soon and I get to become a character because of her expertise. And that's an opportunity I wouldn't have in any other space. So do you think now is the worst time or the best time to start something new? There's a lot of noise, a lot of people have got channels. YouTube is, you know, just celebrated, what, 10 years? It's still a baby, the internet's a baby too, but like, is now the worst time or the best time, you think? I think that that goes back to looking at it the wrong way again. It's not just YouTube, there's Snapchat, there's Instagram, there's apps that haven't even been created yet. It's not about, if you look at things like that, like worst time, wrong time, best time, Am I gonna get famous from this? You're already behind, because you're not thinking forward. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're, you're, not even, you're not even present. You're just like, oh, if I do that, which is already in the wake of what somebody else did, maybe that'll work for me. And Drafting then, strategy. Yeah. It's Burger King to McDonald's. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what is, if there is any secret sauce, what can you share? Because everyone's chasing subscribers and views. Um, break it down for us, tell us some of the What's, what's part of the formula? I know you talk, well, you've kind of already said in a subtle way, it's about authenticity, it's about being yourself, it's about doing it for the right reason, but what else can we do? Because we all have channels now and we're trying to figure it out. You know, there are playbooks that can tell you strategies. Um, I wish I knew, you know, even as someone with two million subscribers or so, you know, I get videos with low views on them Que sera, sera. It, it's tough because I, I think everybody's looking for tricks of the trade and I'm not entirely sure there are any. And I know that's not the most pleasant answer, but I think it's a combination of a lot of different factors. I mean, discovery is completely different on YouTube now. Um, so I think it's about finding your community, which might not necessarily be on YouTube at all. It's finding the appropriate place for the kind of content you wanna make or where the people that you wanna distribute content to are. And for me, I'm, I'm, I get to be a fan of what I do, right? So it's easy for me to find my people because I'm a fan of this space. And so maybe that's a strategy, is to follow your interests. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you're saying it takes one to know one, too, mm -hmm. which is, you know, super smart advice when you think about, you know, kind of live where you're comfortable living, right? If YouTube is the ecosystem and, you know, the friend base, or whatever that you love, or if it's Snapchat, or if it's at, you know, in and out Burger, wherever it is, online, offline. Uh, maybe let's talk about how you've transitioned now to some of these other platforms, you know. Well, it just, something just occurred to me about like, I think that if you look at it like, I wanna have a channel, let me find whatever the white space on the YouTube market is and I'll do that in there and thus we'll have a big, great channel. That would be me being like, hey, let's pretend nobody's crafting online yet, I'm gonna start crafting online. But I don't care about crafting and I'm not good at it. And so it's gonna come across really forced. Yeah. Okay, so let's assume that you're passionate, you're creating your passion, you're doing what you wanna do, um, and you're trying to make a go of it, but it's not working. How long do you give this great idea until you cut bait and get a real job? It's something I think all entrepreneurs struggle with, right? 
whether it's their parents, friend group, or the voice in their head, the resistance, like Steen Pressfield calls it, um, it works against us, right? Like, when are you gonna quit this thing? How long do you give this great idea? I think that it's not, I think that you're looking at it like a job and it's not your passion. You know, um, my, one of my favorite books is called Letters to a Young Poet, and it's by Rainier Marie Rilke. And he says, I write because I must. And if you don't feel like you must, then don't do it, you know? It's like nothing will ever take away my desire to write. I can write in the dead of night. I can write in the middle of the day. I can write in my head when I'm walking down the street. Like, I do it because it's a part of me, regardless of whether or not anyone would ever publish something that you wrote. Like, if you love to write poetry, you're going to write poetry. If you love to make videos, you're going to make videos. If you want to be successful, then try and figure out how to be successful financially. Yeah, I just got goosebumps, by the way, because that, that really strikes a chord with me. Like, that's why I do this. It has to be done. I, I'm inquisitive by nature, but I also, you know, I love to learn. I consider myself this work in progress. Um, yeah. A lot of what you said in your book, uh, and I'm just digging into it right now. Maybe that's a good transition. Um, this kind of feels like a memoir. It is. Yeah, it's 100% a memoir of everything that has happened up until this crazy moment of my life. Yeah, and you didn't hold back. I mean, you, you weren't shy, you know, talking about mistakes and love or sex or all these different things. Um, for the sake of, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, can you talk about some of your mistakes, missteps, whether it's personal or business? Well, you know, a lot of buffering is based off of journals that I've collected for the last decade. And what was really wonderful about collecting these journals and reviewing them as I wrote the book was that I actually got to see things I had finished processing and things I had overcome that I had forgotten about, which is incredible to be able to look back and be like, oh my God, I used to really beat myself up for that. I totally don't do that anymore. Um, I call the book Buffering because it's about processing the data of your life. You know, that little wheel that spins when you're watching Netflix or YouTube or whatever is, is a boundary. It's saying, wait, I'm not done yet. I'm not ready to present to you. And so as it processes, as the pickle, pixels formulate into an image of a pickle, <laughs> as the pixels formulate into an image, then it comes forward. And it's like, here, now I'm fully loaded. I'm ready for you to see. And so the subject matter of buffering is pretty intense. Um, and I wanted to share those stories specifically because I feel like I've come to a real place of peace about them as I transition from my adolescence, my adult adolescence, into being an adult. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of important stuff in there, um, which you seem very comfortable now being completely vulnerable. Um, uh, one of my other favorite authors, Brene Brown, talks about this. Yeah, oh, the power of vulnerability. Well, yeah. 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 Well, she talks about this relationship, right? She says, you know, the depth that you're willing to be vulnerable is the measure of your courage, uh, it, which totally is counterintuitive, right? Like someone like me who doesn't love being vulnerable, guarded, high walls. You know. Inquisitive. Yeah, but I feel like, you know, I don't like to talk about personal stuff because then it opens myself up to pain and all those other uh, I would, but I would say that you're more vulnerable than you think. I mean, you know, you are expressing that you're doing this because you love it and you want to figure this out and you love exploring this. Like, some people don't even say what they love. Like, that is a measure of vulnerability. To be like, this brings me joy. Or like, I was disappointed by this. Like, that is vulnerability. That's honesty. Yeah. Um, so you got a little more courage than you think. Well, thanks. I mean, I'm, I'm also a work in progress and I, I'm getting there, but that... You know, that single, well, a couple of her last books have been, you know, life-changing for me personally. And uh, like I said, I'm just getting into your book, so I'm enjoying it so far. Can you talk about some specifics for me? Like, you know, you can think, oh, man, I really regret doing that, or I wish I would have done it differently. And I only mention it because I think the F word gets a lot of people stuck. Fear, you know, fear of failure in particular, um, you know, in business. Uh, your personal things aside, right? But let, let's talk about some business missteps. Yeah, and um, you know, I, blessedly, I don't really see any missteps. It just are steps, right? And so I used to think of uh, in one chapter called Hello Harto, which is talking about when I moved to LA, and that's kind of really the businessy chapter of the book. Um, I looked at 2012 as a totally failed year because nobody liked any of my ideas. I felt terrible about myself. I felt like I was flying completely blind. I had no idea what I was playing with in the entertainment industry. It wasn't at all like the internet space. I just felt really bad about myself. Um, but all of that led to the decisions I made at the onset of 2013, 
which was uh, to launch a crowdfunding campaign and go on tour across the country, which was going to be a goodbye tour. It was going to be like, hey, guys, thanks so much for supporting me the last couple of years. It looks like entertainment and I don't gel, turns out. But let me come to your town. I want to make a video. I want to give you a hug. Let's volunteer. Let's have a nice time. The tour was so incredibly popular that it actually expanded to 22 cities across America when we were only aiming for 10. After that, I sold a book. After that, we sold a movie. So like all these things took off. And so 2013, objectively, you could be like, aha, 2012 was a failure. 2013 was a success. But 2013 would not have happened without 2012. So it wasn't a misstep. It was just a step. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it's, it's all about experimentation, right? And that's what I've learned, too, is you can't have you know, people who say failure is not an option. That's, that's wrong. Yeah. I mean, you just can't do it. Well, try, I always like to say this. Trying and failing is succeeding at trying. Right, right. Because right. trying is hard. Yeah, yeah. You have to work it out until you get it right. And I'm unfortunately one of these people that, I mean, I get everything wrong before I get it right. It's like, I'm like so much the trial and error guy. Like, it's, it's pathetic, but it's my process, you know, for better or for worse. But that's good, though, because then you get, you kind of, you build. So, I, I mean, I really, maybe I just don't believe in the idea of failure that you can make something of any failure, quote unquote, like whatever a failure is. Because even in that, your brain is learning how to figure out how, how to utilize the parts that you do have. So you try something, oh, that didn't work. Okay, let me look at it, let me think about it. Oh, that didn't work, let me look at it, let me think about it. Like that is a, it's a muscle you're building. The key is not to fail too far that you can't come back to fight another day, <laughs> right? Because um, the, the whole idea is, you know, you will get knocked down, but you gotta get back up. Maybe that's about knowing like maybe that's about knowing how many punches you can take. Because if you're like, yeah, you know what? I'm actually still nursing these last failure bruises. So I'm going to give myself a minute before I get back in the ring. Yeah. Um, what's the hardest part of being you? Ooh, what's the hardest part of being me? Uh, myself. <laughs> yeah, I am really hard on myself all the time. In what area? My brain. <laughs> My brain area. But what is your brain... What's your brain saying to you? Uh, like, I think I hold myself too accountable for everything that happens on this planet. So it's a, it's a, it's my fault thing. Yeah, guilt, and liking to believe that I have more control than I do, and then even knowing that is like, why would you even think that? Like, I have had, I have a pretty negative voice in my head about myself, and I'm working really hard to talk to it. You know, not silence it because that's another like negative action. It's like, shut up. No, it's like, hey, what's up, buddy? Feeling a little stressed? Do you need a nap? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's dancing with it, right? Yeah, it is. There's a, you know what? It's so funny you say that because there's a chapter in Buffering called Shadow Boxer, which is actually about coming to terms with my sexuality. Like, it's about the LGBT journey coming from a very conservative background. And I described it uh, as a shadow boxer. It was this, I was always boxing against this thing nobody else could see because it was just inside me. And then at one point my shadow boxer won. It was like, you're gay. <laughs> and, and so you came to terms with it. And how did, how did that go? How did that go over with your friends, family? Um, well, you know, again, uh, I am my most, most worst enemy. So I basically, I came out to myself. I was in my first relationship when I was 19, my first relationship with a girl. And it still took me a couple years after that to like really be like, okay, but you're gay. You know, because I was like, it's not girls, it's girl. And after she broke up with me, I was like, well, good thing I'm not gay, because that would really hurt. <laughs> um, so I tried to avoid that pain uh, unsuccessfully. And then, so about two years later, I kind of came out to myself, came to terms with my sexuality. And then when I was 24, I started coming out to my extended family and like, you know, outside of my inner circle. After you come out to yourself, you're pretty much right away coming out to like your close, close friends and your found family. Yeah. Um, but from there, around 24 is when I came out to the other people in my life. And then from there, when I moved to New York, it was like coming out every time you meet somebody. You know, I'd be, I was in this new office, just got to New York. People be like, oh wow, so do you have a boyfriend back home? And he'd be like, nope, gay though. Also, single for ladies, <laughs> you know? Just putting it right out there. Just putting it right out there. And it was so terrifying. It's so funny to think back on how I felt, but I was terrified. It's like I would start to sweat when people would ask me, like, got weekend plans? Can I try and, like, meet some guys new to New York? And I would just be like, I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, that must have been really awkward for them. Well, I don't think, you know, it's tough because it's like you never know. You don't know if you're talking to somebody who's like, even when you live in the most progressive cities, you don't know if you're talking to someone with some real like homophobic baggage, you know? Yeah. But you just got to live, you got to live as if you're in the world you want to see because that's the only way you're going to make it, you know? That's great. That's a nugget. That's tweetable right now. <laughs> so maybe let's take that as a metaphor for whatever is your thing, right? Whatever is your difficulty or obstacle. How do you, I mean, you talked about just putting it out there, but like, what do you do when you meet the resistance? Like, mm -mm, you know, I don't accept that or that's not cool with me or no, I'm not into that or, you know, again, whatever your thing is, what's your advice? I think... If you, it really, and maybe this is just, the only way I can understand the world is the way my brain is in the world. And for me, when I meet that resistance, what affects me is my own interpretation of it. If somebody's like, oh, you're gay, that's gross and weird. It's me going, I'm gross and weird. As opposed to being like, compassionate to their misunderstanding or compassionate to their lack of knowledge. Like, oh, how sad that they have they have such a narrow scope because the world is so much bigger than they're going to ever get to see. And like trying to find the root of compassion in that. My mom always taught us, she always taught us never give up. We had a whole song about it when we were kids. Uh, but she also always taught us that there are no bad guys in the story. And I think that's an incredibly giving statement. But it's also true. Like we all have reasons for why we are the way we are. Yeah, also the opening cover page of your book, yeah? Yeah. That's fun. That's, I think you were sharing that. Yeah. Um, maybe the last thing I want to ask you is, you know, like, I know you're living in the moment, you're doing everything right now, but like, what is kind of your legacy? Like, where are you headed and what do you want to accomplish? I'm really, really, really trying to stay present. I, you know, we spend so much of our lives trapped between regret for the past and anticipation of the future, you know, and we, we miss the moment we're in. And so I think right now I'm just trying to really soak this up and really be here. And like, it's so much easier I guess the path before you is unpaved. So I'm just looking at the ground and being like, oh, here we go. Ooh, walking on a path. I like it. Oh my God, <laughs> this is pretty great. You look straight ahead and there's nothing there because we can't control or predict the future. We can guess, but ultimately we can't, right? So it's about just being, being as present in the moment as you can be. That's my plan for the future. 